All right. So uh, thanks for sticking around, and thanks again for inviting us all. And look forward to some interesting discussions. So what I'd like to do is talk a bit about uh, our attempts to use logic. Um, so A implies B, this kind of stuff, uh, to better understand uh, spatial cognition. And especially reference frame conflicts similar to the ones that Marius and Toby talked about. Um, let's see what works. Um, so I'd like to talk a bit about how we started this whole thing. Uh, so what was our initial motivation and kind of wish list. So we started this at the Max Planck Institute and we wanted to really build a framework that helps us understand what is going on with so potential causes of spatial orientation problems, especially in virtual reality where people get lost so much. So we want to know what is going on there. Also, we are just back on a train uh, from a spatial, uh, from a presence conference, and we are quite frustrated with the lack of any clear operational definitions of what that really means and how to measure. So we ask ourselves questions like, well, if anything, you really need spatial uh, presence for. So is there anything? So basically, spatial presence is a necessary prerequisite for anything in particular. And so this idea of necessary prerequisite is, is basically what uh, is used in logic quite a bit. So one example we uh, thought of was, well, you probably wouldn't have any fear of height in virtual reality unless you really are fully immersed and you're uh, no longer aware of the physical environment. Otherwise, you might not really encounter uh, uh, the fear of height. And because while we're dealing with humans and not with American politics, it's not a binary thing. Uh, so we uh, uh, think more of fuzzy logic. So uh, basically, the more spatial presence is incurred, the more fear of height should also be inherent in virtual reality. And then we can kind of build up a logical chain. For example, we propose that spatial presence implies that there's basically not much of a reference frame of conflict going on between what you're, for example, simulating in virtual reality and where you're physically at. So no concurrent egocentric reference frame conflicts like the ones that Marius might have mentioned. Um, also, we wanted, given that we're in spatial cognition, we wanted to build a tool or a visual representation that really facilitates, supports visual spatial thinking and human reasoning, and also uh, creates testable prediction hypotheses. Uh, you can see we're quite frustrated with the presence community at the time. Um, so to do this, we try to create a framework of logical connections between processes and structures related to spatial orientation, distinguished between data, processes, uh, goals in there, and came up with this kind of visual representation. I won't go through the whole thing. Main idea is, so you have some different spatial orientation at the top as the ultimate goal, and you have different kinds of spatial behavior, so adaptable, learning oriented. This is the main part I focused on. This is about more intuitive, quick orientation, so based on spatial updating processes. You can also have macro based, accurate and precise mitigation, things like that. So um, just as an example, so the whole landmark uh, navigation uh, branch here, so for piloting probably, uh, for example, you necessarily need to be able to identify some kind of objects that you have in, land, in your landmark memory. You need to be able to localize them, otherwise this just won't work. For spatial updating, it's kind of similar to this side. Um, so in order to do continuous spatial updating, you obviously need to perceive self-motion uh, and then integrate this. For this to happen, you have to have some kind of motion perception. Uh, for this to have, uh, you have to have also spatial uh, perception. But in addition, there's other parts. For what we propose is that spatial presence at the neural is a necessary prerequisite for you to really tap into these automatized low cognitive load processes like automatic spatial updating. And spatial updating will only happen if uh, this kind of consistency check between concurrent reference frame gives uh, a green light, basically. So it uh, tells you uh, there's a strong conflict between where you're physically at and what you're supposed to imagine or what uh, virtual reality is uh, doing, then you won't be very present. This will interfere with continuous spatial updating. And uh, similar with also with this instantaneous or instant-based spatial updating. What we mean by that is, well, let me give you an example. So if you fall asleep as a passenger in a car, you wake up, you recognize the space, almost immediately, as soon as you recognize it, it kind of forcefully re-anchors you to that point. And there's probably anything you can do about it. As soon as you recognize it, it's there. Because there isn't much interference going on because there wasn't really too much of a prior spatial representation. And then virtual reality can have a similar uh, thing, basically. So for this kind of instant-based or instantaneous spatial update, again, you have the localization branch, so you need to identify the localized landmarks, and you need to be spatially present in it. Um, so I'd like to talk a little bit more about what is going on in this uh, reference frame. So it's all kind of 
pictorial and iconic, uh, but I guess that's just closer to the way of thinking. So if, if this is kind of our box for short-term spatial memory or spatial working memory, the little limited capacity transient representation, then we have some kind of embodied representation that could be the automatically activated sensory motor representation that especially Marius talked about in his experiment uh, there. But you could have additional representations. This could be an imagined uh, representation if an imagined task or a mediated uh, embodied representation like in virtual reality or other uh, media. And of course, you, if you deal with multiple representation, there might be a cost in just maintaining these or switching attention between uh, these different reference frames. The thing I'd like to focus on mostly here is this uh, specific conflict between two embodied representation in working memory. So concurrent reference frame conflicts. In particular, there could be two costs. One's kind of just to instantiate an additional representation and to transform it once it's already in there. Of course, you could have other uh, representations in working memory that do not conflict because they're not as embodied or not really that spatial. So we won't talk about this. So just as an example, so if you have a simulated reference frame, that's basically what you present in virtual reality, for example, and you also have the physical environment, um, that is kind of the other, the physical reference frame, uh, simply speaking. One of the reasons people like that mount display so much is because they basically block out your view of the physical reference frame. So supposedly, you have re less reference frame conflict. Um, another example is desktop VR, where uh, the virtual reality is very small, so to say, or, or this kind of game. So there might be more conflict. The physical might actually dominate over the simulated. Or they might be more on an equal level. And in these situations where you have some kind of conflict going on, in this kind of logical uh, model, everything that's come up there, so we dependent on this reference frame, consistency will also be impaired. So if there's basically interference or lack of consistency, spatial updating will be impaired, and everything up there will also be impaired. So the two automatized spatial updating processes, continuous and instantaneous, will be impaired, which means you will not be able to tap into these automatized, quick, intuitive uh, processes. And we propose that this is one of the reasons why people get lost so easily, where they hate these games, and you have to put all these uh, landmarks into virtual environments, online gaming, to make them work at all. Because, I mean, if you can still identify them, you can do the task, and if you're highly uh, trained uh, and have a lot of learning, then you might still be able to do them relatively fast, but it's not that intuitive unless highly overlearned. So, going back to this kind of view, just so I have a bit more space to lay out the different parts. So, if you apply this kind of uh, idea of logic, obviously, in order to do a consistent check, you need spatial working memory. And it would kind of give a green light if there's no concurrent egocentric embodied reference frame conflict, so no interference. And that is a necessary prerequisite for spatial presence and immersion to occur. And in turn, this is a necessary prerequisite for the kind of continuous automatic spatial updating, in the sense that this allows for lower transformation costs in here. Um, talked to us about the field of heights, reflexive movements, basically only if you're fully spatially present in VR will you duck at the approaching ball, will you get fear of height, uh, will you be experiencing interesting pitch room experiences and so on. Similar to the instant-based spatial updating, so by being spatially present, this lowers the transformation and instantiation costs that you have with multiple representations. And we also think that it might be necessary for the relative ease of, of adopting new perspective. So basically, you can adopt a new perspective easily if there's no conflict with another one that you already have in memory. And now the interesting thing about logic, uh, so this should be logic and errors, ignore that, is basically if you have A implies B, you can uh, do the math, uh, and that's equivalent to saying non-B implies non-E, uh, non-A. So basically if you uh, have an inconsistency of this consistency check, so basically interference between concurrent reference frames, you can invert all the errors. So this implies an impaired spatial presence and immersion. This implies an impairment of the automatic continuous spatial updating process of this kind of obligatory reflex-like behavior, uh, impaired automatic spatial updating, and the adopting of new perspectives. Maybe. And so the interesting things of these logical errors is uh, you can just read them. Once you get used to them, it's actually quite nice. So basically, if you observe continuous spatial updating, this implies that people were spatially present. This implies that it was not much of a reference frame conflict. And the other way around, 
if uh, you have an inconsistent or a reference frame conflict, this implies that, and so on. So it's, to us, it provides really an interesting way of reasoning about space. We also try to lay it out spatially. So with these goals in mind, I uh, really want to point out this is, this is one big work in progress. So it's basically a framework of working hypotheses meant to be discussed, meant to be a thinking tool more than a, okay, this is the theory. Um, and what I'd love to discuss further with you guys uh, over the next hour or whenever we have time over here is to see is, is it uh, fruitful, is it useful, does it make any sense, could it be extended, could it be merged with other approaches like, like R, for example, I don't know. Um, so yeah, that's what I hope to do uh, later in the breakout sessions. Thanks so much.